Miss Strange was not in a responsive mood. This her employer had observed on first entering, yet he showed no hesitation in lying on the table behind which she had ensconced herself in the attitude of one besieged, an envelope thick with enclosed papers. There, he said. Telephone me when you've read them. I shall not read them. No, he smiled, and repossessing himself of the envelope, he tore off one end, extracted the sheets with which it was filled, and laid them down, still folded, in their proper place on the tabletop. The suggestiveness of this action caused the corners of Miss Strange's delicate lips to twitch wistfully before settling into an ironic smile. Calmly the other watched her. "'I am on a vacation,' she loftily explained, as she finally met his studiously non-quizzical glance. "'Oh, I know that I am in my own home,' she petulantly acknowledged as his gaze took in the room and that the automobile is at the door, and that I'm dressed for shopping, but for all that I am on a vacation, a mental one, she emphasized, and business must wait. I haven't got over the last affair, she protested, as he maintained a discreet silence, and the season is so gay just now, so many balls, so many, but that isn't the worst. Father is beginning to wake up. And if he ever suspects, a significant gesture ended this appeal. The personage knew her father. Everyone did. And the wonder had always been that she dared run the risk of displeasing one so implacable. Though she was his favorite child, Peter Strange was known to be quite capable of cutting her off with a shilling. Once his closed, prejudiced mind conceived it to be his duty— and that he would so interpret the situation if he ever came to learn the secret of his daughter's fits of abstraction and the sly bank account she was slowly accumulating. The personage holding out this dangerous lure had no doubt at all. Yet he only smiled at her words and remarked in casual suggestion, "'It's out of town this time. Way out. Your health certainly demands a change of air.' "'My health is good, fortunately or unfortunately, as one may choose to look at it. "'It furnishes me with no excuse for an outing,' she steadily retorted, turning her back on the table. "'Oh, excuse me,' the insidious voice apologized. "'Your paleness misled me. Surely a night or two's change might be beneficial.' She gave him a quick side look and began to adjust her boa. To this hint he paid no attention. "'The affair is quite out of the ordinary,' he pursued in the tone of one rehearsing a part. But there he stopped. For some reason not altogether apparent to the masculine mind, the pin of the flashing stones, real stones, which held her hat in place, had to be taken out and thrust back again, not once, but twice. It was to watch this performance he had paused— when he was ready to proceed, he took the musing tone of one marshalling the facts for another's enlightenment. A woman of unknown instincts. Pshaw! The end of the pin would strike against the comb holding Violet's chestnut-coloured locks. Living in a house as mysterious as the secret it contains, but— Here he allowed his patience apparently to forsake him. I will bore you no longer. Go to your teas and balls. I will struggle with my dark affairs alone. His hand went to the packet of papers she affected so ostentatiously to despise. He could be as nonchalant as she. But he did not lift them. He let them lie. Yet the young heiress had not made a movement or even turned the slightest glance his way. A difficult woman to understand. A mysterious house— possibly a mysterious crime. Thus Violet kept repeating in silent self-communion. As flushed with dancing she sat that evening in a highly scented conservatory, dividing her tension between the compliments of her partner and the splash of a fountain bubbling in the heart of this mass of tropical foliage. 
and when some hours later she sat down in her chintz-furnished bedroom for a few minutes thought before retiring it was to draw from a little oak box at her elbow the half-dozen or so folded sheets of closely written paper which had been left for her perusal by her persistent employer glancing first at the signature and finding it to be one already favorably known at the bar she read with avidity the statement of events thus vouched for finding them curious enough in all conscience to keep her awake for another full hour we here subscribe it i am a lawyer with an office in the times square building my business is mainly local but sometimes i am called out of town as witness the following summons received by me on the fifth of last october dear sir i wish to make my will i am an invalid and cannot leave my room will you come to me the enclosed reference will answer for my respectability if it satisfies you and you decide to accommodate me please hasten your visit i have not many days to live a carriage will meet you at highland station at any hour you designate telegraph reply a postlewaite gloom cottage new jersey the reference given was a mr weed of eighty sixth street a well-known man of unimpeachable reputation calling him up at his business office i asked him what he could tell me about mr postlewaite of gloom cottage new jersey the answer astonished me there is no mr apostle wait to be found at that address he died years ago there is a mrs apostle wait a confirmed paralytic do you mean her i glanced at the letter still lying open at the side of the telephone the signature reads a apostle wait then it's she her name is arabella she hates the name being a woman of no sentiment uses her initials even on her checks what does she want of you to draw her will oblige her it'll be experience for you and he slammed home the receiver i decided to follow the suggestion so forcibly emphasized and the next day saw me at highland station a superannuated horse and a still more superannuated carriage awaited me both too old to serve a busy man in these days of swift conveyance could this be a sample of the establishment I was about to enter? Then I remembered that the woman who had sent for me was a helpless invalid and probably had no use for any sort of turnout. The driver was in keeping with the vehicle and as noncommittal as the plodding beast he drove. If I ventured upon a remark, he gave me a long and curious look. If I went so far as to attack him with a direct question, he responded with a hitch of his shoulder or a dubious smile which conveyed nothing. Was he deaf or just unpleasant? I learned that he was not deaf, for suddenly, after a jog-trot of a mile or so through a wooded road which we had entered from the main highway, he drew in his horse and, without glancing my way, he spoke his first word. "'This is where you get out.' the house is back there in the bushes as no house was visible and the bushes rose in an unbroken barrier along the road i stared at him in some doubt of his sanity but i began a protest in which he at once broke with the sharp direction take the path it'll lead you straight to the front door i don't see any path for this he had no answer and confident from his expression that it would be useless to expect anything further from him, I dropped a coin into his hand and jumped to the ground. He was off before I could turn myself about. Hmm, something is rotten in the state of Denmark, I quoted in a startled comment to myself, and not knowing what else to do, stared down at the turf at my feet. A bit of flagging met my eye, protruding from a layer of thick moss. Further on I espied another, the second probably of many. This, no doubt, was the path I had been bidden to follow. And, without further thought on the subject, I plunged into the bushes which, with difficulty, I made give way before me. For a moment all further advance looked hopeless a more tangled, uninviting approach to a so-called home I had never seen outside the tropics, 
and the complete neglect thus displayed should have prepared me for the appearance of the house i unexpectedly came upon just as the way seemed on the point of closing before me but nothing could well prepare one for the first view of gloom cottage its location in a hollow which had gradually filled itself up with trees and some kind of prickly brush its deeply stained walls once picturesque enough in their grouping but too deeply hidden now amid rotting boughs to produce any other effect other than that of shrouded desolation the so of these same boughs as they wrapped a devil's tattoo against each other and the absence of even the rising column of smoke which bespeaks domestic life wherever seen all gave to one who remembered the cognomen cottage and forgot the precognomen of gloom a sense of buried life as sepulchre as that which emanates from the mouth of some freshly opened tomb but these impressions natural enough to my youth were necessarily transient and soon gave way to others more businesslike perceiving the curve of an arch rising above the undergrowth still blocking my approach i pushed my way resolutely through and presently found myself stumbling upon the steps of an unexpectedly spacious domicile built not of wood as the name cottage had led me to expect but of carefully cut stone which while showing every mark of time proclaimed itself one of those early carefully erected colonial residences which it takes more time than a century to destroy or even wear to the point of dilapidation somewhat encouraged though failing to detect any signs of active life in the heavily shuttered windows frowning upon me from either side i ran up the steps and rang the bell which pulled as hard as if no hand had touched it in years then i waited but not to ring again for just as my hand was approaching the bell a second time the door fell back and i beheld in the black gap before me the oldest man i had ever come upon in my whole life he was so old i was astonished when he drew his lips open and asked if i was the lawyer from new york i would as soon have expected a mummy to wag its tongue and utter english he looked so thin and dried and removed from this life and all worldly concerns but when i had answered his question and he had turned to marshal me down the hall towards a door i could dimly see standing open in the twilight of an absolutely sunless interior i noticed that his step was not without some vigor despite the feeble bend of his withered body and the incessant swaying of his head which seemed to be continually saying no i will prepare madam he admonished me after drawing a ponderous curtain two inches or less aside from one of the windows she is very ill but she will see you the tone was senile but it was the senility of an educated man and as the cultivated accents waver forth my mind changed in regard to the position he held in the house interested anew i sought to give him another look but he had already vanished through the doorway and noiselessly it was more like a shadow flitting than a man's withdrawal the darkness in which i sat was absolute but gradually as i continued to look about me the spaces lightened and certain details came out which to my astonishment were of a character to show that the plain if substantial exterior of this house with its choked up approaches and weedy gardens was no sample of what was to be found inside though the walls surrounding me were dismal because unlighted they betrayed a splendor unusual in any country home the frescoes and paintings were of an ancient order dating from days when life and not death reigned in this isolated dwelling but in them high art reigned supreme an art so high and so finished that only great wealth combined with the most cultivated taste could have produced such effects i was still absorbed in the wonder of it all when the quiet voice of the old gentleman who had let me in reached me again from the doorway and i heard madam is ready for you 
May I trouble you to accompany me to her room? I rose with alacrity. I was anxious to see Madame, if only to satisfy myself that she was as interesting as the house in which she was self immured I found her a great deal more so. But before I enter upon our interview, let me mention a fact which had attracted my attention in my passage to her room. During his absence, my guide evidently had pulled aside other curtains than those of the room in which he had left me. The hall, no longer a tunnel of darkness, gave me a glimpse as we went by of various secluded corners, and it seemed as if everywhere I looked I saw a clock. I counted four before we reached the staircase, all standing on the floor and all of ancient make, though differing much in appearance and value. The fifth one rose grim and tall at the stair foot, and under an impulse I have never understood I stopped when I reached it to note the time. But it had paused in its task, and faced me with motionless hands and silent works, a fact which somehow startled me, perhaps because just then I encountered the old man's eye watching me with an expression as challenging as it was unintelligible. I had expected to see a woman in bed. I saw, instead, a woman sitting up. You felt her influence the moment you entered her presence. She was not young. She was not beautiful. Never had been I should judge. She had not the usual marks about her of an ultra-strong personality, but that her will was law, had always been, and would continue to be law so long as she lived, was patent to any eye at first glance. She exacted obedience consciously and unconsciously, and she exacted it with charm. So few people in the world possess this power. They frown, and the opposing will weakens. They smile, and all hearts succumb. I was hers from the moment I crossed the threshold till, but I will relate the happenings of that instant when it comes. She was alone, or so I thought, when I made my first bow to her stern but not unpleasing presence, seated in a great chair with a silver tray before her containing such little matters as she stood in hourly need of, she confronted me with a piercing gaze, startling to behold, in eyes so colorless. Then she smiled, and in obedience to that smile I seated myself in a chair placed very near her own. Was she too paralyzed to express herself clearly? I waited in some anxiety till she spoke, when this fear vanished. Her voice betrayed the character her features failed to express. It was firm, resonant, and instinct with command, not loud, but penetrating, and of all quality which made one listen with his heart as well as with his ears. What she said is immaterial. I was there for a certain purpose, and we entered immediately upon the business of that purpose. She talked, and I listened, mostly without comment. Only once did I interrupt her with a suggestion, and as this led to definite results. I will proceed to relate the occurrence in full. In the few hours remaining to me before leaving New York, I had learned, no matter how, some additional particulars concerning herself and family, and when, after some minor bequest, she proceeded to name the parties to whom she desired to leave the bulk of her fortune, I ventured, with some astonishment of my own temerity, to remark, "'But you have a young relative. Is she not to be included in this partition of your property?' A hush and a smile came to life on her stiff lips, such as is seldom seen, thank God, on the face of any woman. And I heard, The young woman of whom you speak is in the room. She has known for some time that I have no intention of leaving anything to her. There is, in fact, 
small chance of her ever needing it. The latter sentence was a muttered one, but it was loud enough to be heard in all parts of the room. I was soon assured, for a quick sigh, which was almost a gasp, followed from a corner I had hitherto ignored, and upon glancing that way I perceived peering upon us from the shadow the white face of a young girl in whose drawn features and wide staring eyes I beheld such evidence of terror that in an instant whatever predilection I had hitherto felt for my client vanished in distrust, if not positive aversion. I was still under the sway of this new impression when Mrs. Postulate's voice rose again. "'You may go,' she said with such force in the command for all of its honeyed modulation that I expected to see the object fly the room in frightened obedience. But though the startled girl had lost most of the terror which had made her face like a mask, no power of movement remained to her, a picture of hopeless misery." She stood for one breathless moment, with her eyes fixed in an unmistakable appeal on mine. Then she began to sway helplessly that I leapt with bounding heart to catch her. As she fell into my arms, I heard her sigh as before. No common anguish spoke in that sigh. I had stumbled unwittingly upon a tragedy, to the meaning of which I held but a doubtful key. She seems very ill. I observed with some emphasis, as I turned to lay my helpless burden on a nearby sofa. "'She's doomed!' The words were spoken with gloom, and with an attempt at communication which no longer rang true in my ears. "'She's as sick as a woman as I am myself,' continued Mrs. Postlewaite. "'That is why I made the remark I did.' never imagining she would hear me at that distance. Do not put her down. My nurse will be here in a moment to relieve you of your burden. A tinkle accompanied these words. The resolute woman had stretched out a finger, of whose use she was not quite deprived, and touched a little bell standing on the tray before her, an inch or two from her hand. Pleased to obey her command, I paused at the sofa's edge, and taking advantage of the momentary delay, studied the youthful countenance pressed unconsciously to my breast. It was one whose appeal lay less in its beauty, though that was a touching quality, than in the story it told, a story which, for some unaccountable reason, I did not pause to determine what won. I felt it to be my immediate duty to know, but I asked no question then. I did not even venture to comment, and yielded her up with seeming readiness with a strong but none too intelligent woman came running in with arms outstretched to carry her off. When the door had closed upon these two, the silence of my client drew my attention back to herself. I am waiting, was her quiet observation, and without any further reference to what had just taken place under our eyes, she went on with the business previously occupying us. I was able to do my part without any too great display of my own disturbance. The clearness of my remarkable client's instructions, the definiteness with which her mind was made up as the disposal of every dollar of her vast property, made it easy for me to master each detail and make careful note of every wish. But this did not prevent the ebb and flow within me of an undercurrent of thought full of question and uneasiness. What had been the real purport of the scene to which I had just been made a surprise witness? The few but certainly unusual facts which had been given me in regard to the extraordinary relations existing between the two closely connected women will explain the intensity of my interest. Those facts shall be yours. Arabella Merwin, when young, was gifted with a particular fascination which, as we have seen, had not altogether vanished with age. Consequently, she had many lovers, 
among them two brothers, Frank and Andrew Postlewaite. The latter was the older, the handsomer, and the most prosperous. His name is remembered yet in connection with South American schemes of large importance. But it was Frank she married. That real love, ardent if unreasonable, lay at the bottom of her choice, is evident enough to those who followed the career of the young couple. But it was a jealous love which brooked no rival, and, as Frank postulate was of an impulsive and erratic nature, scenes soon occurred between them which, while revealing the extraordinary force of the young wife's character, led to no serious break until after her son was born, and this notwithstanding the fact that Frank had long given up making a living, and that they were openly dependent on their wealthy brother, now fast approaching the millionaire status. This brother, the Peruvian king, as some called him, must have been an extraordinary man. Though cherishing his affection for the spirited Arabella to the point of remaining a bachelor for her sake, he betrayed none of the usual signs of disappointed love, but on the contrary, made every effort to advance her happiness, not only by assuring to herself and husband an adequate income, but by doing all he could in other and less open ways to lessen any sense she might entertain of her mistake in preferring for her life-mate this self-centered and unstable brother. She should have adored him, but though she evinced gratitude enough, there is nothing to prove that she ever gave Frank postulate the least cause to cherish any other sentiment towards his brother than that of honest love and unqualified respect. Perhaps he never did cherish any other. Perhaps the change which everyone saw in the young couple immediately after the birth of their only child was due to another cause. Gossip is silent on this point. All that it insists upon is that, from the time evidences of the growing estrangement between them became so obvious that even the indulgent Andrew could not blind himself to it, showing his sense of trouble not by lessening their income, for that he doubled, but by spending more time in Peru and less in New York where the two were living. However, and here we enter upon those details which I have ventured to characterize as uncommon. He was in this country and in the actual company of his brother when the accident occurred which terminated both their lives. It was the old story of a skidding motor and Mrs. Postlewaite having been sent for in a great haste to the small inn into which the two injured men had been carried, arrived only in time to witness their last moments. Frank died first, and Andrew some few minutes later, an important fact, as was afterwards shown when the latter's will came to be read. This was a peculiar one. By its provision, the bulk of the king's great property was left to his brother Frank, but with this especial stipulation that in case his brother failed to survive him, the full legacy, as bequeathed to him, should be given unconditionally to his widow. Frank's demise, as I have already stated, preceded his brother's by several minutes, and, consequently, Arabella became the chief legatee, and that is how she obtained her millions. But, and here... A startling feature comes in. When the will came to be administered, the secret underlying the break between Frank and his wife was brought to light by a revelation of the fact that he had practiced a great deception upon her at the time of his marriage. Instead of being a bachelor, as was currently believed, he was, in reality, a widower and the father of a child. This fact, so long held secret, had become hers when her own child was born and constituted as she was, she not only never forgave the father, but conceived such a hatred for the innocent object of their quarrel that she refused to admit its claim or even acknowledge its existence. But later, after his death, in fact, 
she showed some sense of obligation toward one who, under ordinary conditions, would have shared her wealth. When the whole story became heard, and she discovered that this secret had been kept from his brother as well as from her, and that consequently no provision had been made in any way for the child thus thrown directly upon her mercy, she did the generous thing, and took the forsaken girl into her own home. But she never betrayed the least love for her, her whole heart being bound up in her own boy, who was, as all agree, a prodigy of talent. But this boy, for all his promise and seeming strength of constitution, died when barely seven years old, and the desolate mother was left with nothing to fill her heart but the uncongenial daughter of her husband's first wife. The fact that this child, slighted as it had hitherto been, would, in the event of her uncle having passed away before her father, have been the undisputed heiress of a large portion of the wealth now at the disposal of her arrogant stepmother, led many to expect, now that the boy was no more, that Mrs. Postulate would proceed to acknowledge the little Helena as her heir, and give her that place in the household to which her natural claims entitled her. But no such result followed. Passion of grief, into which the mother was thrown by the shipwreck of all her hopes, left her hard and implacable, and when, as very soon happened, she fell victim to the disease which tied her to her chair, and made the wealth which had come to her by such a peculiar ordering of circumstances little less than a mockery even in her own eyes. It was upon this child she expended the full fund of her secret bitterness. And the child? What of her? How did she bear her unhappy fate when she grew old enough to realize it? With the resignation, which was the wonder of all who knew her, no murmurs escaped her lips, nor was the devotion she invariably displayed to the exacting invalid who ruled her, as well as all the rest of her household, with a rod of iron, ever disturbed by the least sign of reproach. Though the riches which in those early days poured into the home in a measure far beyond the needs of its mistress were expended in making the house beautiful rather than in making the one young life within it happy. She never was heard to utter so much as a wish to leave the walls within which fate had immured her. Content, or seemingly content, with the only home she knew, she never asked for change or demanded friends or amusements. Visitors ceased coming. Desolation followed neglect. The garden, once a glory, succumbed to the riot of weeds and undesirable brush, till a towering wall seemed to be drawn about the house, cutting it off from the activities of the world as it cut it off from the approach of sunshine by day and the comfort of starlit heaven by night. And yet the young girl continued to smile, though with a pitifulness of late, which seemed thought betokened secret terror, and others the wasting of a body too sensitive for such unwholesome seclusion. These were the facts, known if not consciously specialized, which gave the latter part of my interview with Mrs. Postlewaite a poignancy of interest which had never attended any of my former experiences. The peculiar attitude of Miss Postlewaite toward her indurate tormentor awakened in my agitated mind something much deeper than curiosity, but when I strove to speak her name with the intent of inquiring more particularly into her condition, such a look confronted me from the steady eye immovably fixed upon my own that my courage, or was it my natural precaution, bade me subdue the impulse and risk no attempt which might betray the depth of my interest in one so completely outside the scope of my present moment's business. Perhaps Mrs. Postlewaite appreciated my struggle. Perhaps she was wholly blind to it. There was no reading the mind of this woman of sentimental name 
but inflexible nature, and realizing the fact more fully with every word she uttered, I left her at last with no further betrayal of my feelings than might be evinced by the earnestness with which I promised to return for her signature at the earliest possible moment. This she had herself requested, saying, as I rose, I can still write my name if the paper is pushed carefully along under my hand. See to it that you come while the power remains to me. I had hoped that in my passage downstairs I might run upon someone who would give me news of Miss Postlewaite, but the woman who approached to conduct me downstairs was not of an appearance to invite confidence, and I felt forced to leave the house with my doubts unsatisfied. Two memories, equally distinct, followed me. One was the picture of Mrs. Postlewaite's fingers groping among her belongings on the little tray perched on her lap, and another of the intent and strangely bent figure of the old man who had acted as my usher, listening to the ticking of one of the great clocks. So absorbed was he in this occupation that he not only failed to notice me when I went by, but he did not even lift his head at my cheery greeting. Such mysteries were too much for me, and led me to postpone my departure from town till I had sought out Mrs. Postlewaite's doctor and propounded to him one or two leading questions. First, would Mrs. Postlewaite's present condition be likely to hold till Monday? And, secondly, was the young lady living with her as ill as her stepmother said? He was a mild old man of an easy-going type, and the answers I got from him were far from satisfactory. Yet he showed some surprise when I mentioned the extent of Mrs. Postlewaite's anxiety about her stepdaughter, and paused in a dubious shaking of his head to give me a short stare in which I read as much determination as perplexity. I will look into Miss Postlewaite's case more particularly, were his parting words, and with this one gleam of comfort I had to be content. Monday's interview was a brief one, and contained nothing worth repeating. Mrs. Postlewaite listened with stoical satisfaction to the reading of the will I had drawn up, and upon its completion rang her bell for the two witnesses awaiting her summons in an adjoining room. They were not of her household, but to all appearance honest villagers, but with one noticeable characteristic, an overweening idea of Mrs. Postlewaite's importance. Perhaps the spell she had so liberally woven for others in other and happier days was felt by them at this hour. It would not be strange. I had almost fallen under it myself. So great was the fascination of her manner, even in this wreck of her bodily powers, when triumph assured, she faced us all in a state of complete satisfaction. But before I was again quit of the place, all my doubts returned, and in fuller force than ever. I had lingered in my going as much as decency would permit, hoping to hear a step on the stair or see a face in some doorway which would contradict Mrs. Postlewaite's cold assurance that Miss Postlewaite was no better. But no such step did I hear, and no face did I see, save the old old one of the ancient friend or relative, whose bent frame seemed continually to haunt the halls. As before, he stood listening to the monotonous ticking of one of the clocks, muttering to himself, and quite oblivious of my presence. However, this time I decided not to pass him without a more persistent attempt to gain his notice. Pausing at his side, I asked him, in a friendly tone, I thought was best calculated to attract his attention, how Miss Postlewaite was today. He was so intent upon his task, whatever that was, that while he turned my way, it was with a glance as blank as that of a stone image. Listen, he admonished me. It says, no, no. I don't think it will ever say anything else. I stared at him in some consternation, then at the clock itself, 
which was the tall one I had found run down at my first visit. There was nothing unusual in its quiet tick, so far as I could hear, and with a compassionate glance at the old man who had turned breathlessly again to listen, proceeded on my way without another word. The old fellow was daft, a century old and daft. I had worked my way out through the vines which still encumbered the porch, and was taking my first steps down the walk when some impulse made me turn and glance up at one of the windows. Did I bless the impulse? I thought I had every reason for doing so, when through a network of interlacing branches I beheld the young girl with whom my mind was wholly occupied, standing with her head thrust forward, watching the descent of something small and white which she had just released from her hand. A note! A note written by her and meant for me! With a grateful look in her direction, which was probably lost upon her as she was already drawn back out of sight, I sprang for it only to meet with disappointment, for it was no billet doux I received from amid the clustering brush where it had fallen, but a small square of white cloth showing a line of fantastic embroidery. Annoyed beyond measure, I was about to fling it down again, when the thought that it had come from her hand deterred me, and I thrust it into my vest pocket. When I took it out again, which was soon after I had taken my seat in the car, I discovered what a mistake I should have made if I had followed my first impulse, for upon examining the stitches more carefully I perceived that what I had considered mere decorative pattern was in fact a string of letters, and that these letters made words, and that these words were I-D-O-N-O-T-W-A-N-T-T-O-D-I-E-B-U-T-I S U R E L Y W I L L I F, or in plain writing, I do not want to die, but I surely will if. Finish the sentence for me. That is the problem I offer you. It is not a case for the police, but one well worth your attention. If you succeed in reaching the heart of this mystery and saving this young girl, only let no delay occur. The doom, if doom it is, is eminent. Remember that the will is signed. She is too small. I did not ask you to send me a midget. Thus spoke Mrs. Postlewaite to her doctor as he introduced into her presence a little figure in a nurse's cap and apron. You said to me, you said I needed care more care than I was receiving. I answered that my old nurse could give it, and you objected that she or someone else must look after Miss Postlewaite. I did not see the necessity, but I never contradict a doctor. So I yielded to your wishes, but not without the provisio. You remember that I made a provisio that whatever sort of young woman you chose to introduce into this room, she should not be fresh from the training schools, and that she should be strong, silent, and capable. And you bring me this might of a woman. Is she a woman? She looks more like a child, of pleasing countenance enough, but who can no more lift me? Pardon me. Little Miss Strange had advanced. I think if you will allow me the privilege, madam, that I can shift you into a much more comfortable position. And with the deftness and ease certainly not to be expected from one of her slight physique, Violet raised the helpless invalid a trifle more upon her pillow. The act, its manner, and the smile accompanying it could not fail to please, and undoubtedly did, though no word rewarded her 
from the lips, not so much given to speech, save when the occasion was imperative, but Mrs. Postlewaite made no further objection to her presence, and, seeing this, the doctor's countenance relaxed, and he left the room with a much lighter step than with which he had entered it. And thus it was that Violet Strange, an adept in more ways than one, became installed at the bedside of this mysterious woman whose days, if numbered, still held possibilities of action which those interested in young Helena Postlewaite's fate would do well to recognize. Miss Strange had been at her post for two days and had gathered up the following. That Mrs. Postlewaite must be obeyed that her stepdaughter, who did not wish to die, would die if she knew it to be the wish of this domineering but apparently idolized woman, that the old man of the clocks, while senile in some regards, was very alert and quite youthful in others. If a century old, which she began greatly to doubt, he had the language and the manner of one in his prime, when unaffected by the neighborhood of the clocks, which seemed to be in some non-understandable way to exercise an occult influence over him. At table he was an entertaining host, but neither there nor elsewhere would he discuss the family or dilate in any way upon the peculiarities of a household of which he had manifestly regarded himself as the least important member." Yet no one knew them better, and when Violet became quite assured of this, as well as the futility of looking for explanation of any kind from either of her two patients, she resolved upon an effort to surprise one from him. She went about it this way, noting his custom of making a complete round of the clocks each night after dinner, she took advantage of Mrs. Postlewaite's inclination to sleep at this hour, to follow him from clock to clock in the hope of overhearing some portion of the monologue with which he bent his head to the swinging pendulum, or put his ear to the hidden works. Soft-footed and discreet, she tripped along at his back, and at each pause he made, paused herself and turned her ear his way. The extreme darkness of the halls, which were more somber by night than by day, favored this attempt, and she was able, after a failure or two, to catch the no, 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 which fell from his lips in seeming repetition of what he heard most of them say. The satisfaction in his tone proved that the denial to which he listened chimed in with his hopes and gave ease to his mind. But he looked his oldest when, after pausing at another of the many timepieces, he echoed in answer to its special refrain, Yes, 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 and fled the spot with shaking body and a distracted air. The same fear and the same shrinking were observable in him as he returned from listening to the least conspicuous one, standing in a short corridor where Violet could not follow him. But when, after a hesitation which enabled her to slip behind the curtain hiding the drawing-room door, he approached and laid his ear against the great one standing, as if on guard, at the foot of the stairs, she saw by the renewed vigor he displayed that there was comfort for him in its message, even before she caught the whisper with which he left it and proceeded to mount the stairs. It says no. It says no. I will heed it as the voice of heaven. But one conclusion could be the result of such an experiment to the mind like Violet's. This partly touched old man not only held the key to the secret of this house, but was in a mood to divulge it if he could be induced to hear command instead of dissuasion in the tick of this one large clock. But how could he be induced? Violet returned to Mrs. Postlewaite's bedside in a mood of extreme thoughtfulness. End of Section 8, Problem 6, The House of Clocks, Part 1 Recorded by Deborah Maddock.